Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games, back with another cool arcade game video for you today. We're going to work on a really cool one today. You've probably already read the title, didn't you? Did you read the title? Ugh. We have a Key Games, also known as Atari, <laughs> Sprint 2 arcade game here. They call this Sprint 2 because Sprint 1 had one steering wheel. This has two steering wheels. So we picked this up a little while back with the, some other stuff. This was in a um, meat shop. <laughs> was it a meat shop, Joe? Butcher shop. Butcher shop. This was in a butcher shop. Um, and it's been abused a little bit. And it's old. It's from the 70s. But that's the ones we like, right? So we're going to fix it up. And you're going to see us do it on this video. So stay tuned. Uh, but I'm going to show you the condition that it's in as we brought it in. It's got some damage to it, unfortunately, on this left side. I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, a little rusty. But this should clean up. Nothing a little black paint won't fix. Coin doors beat up a little bit. But... Pretty complete. Control panel is in decent shape. A little bit of wear there, but it's just black silk screen, so you can touch that up. Um, it's had some issues with the steering wheels. We'll, we're going to do a whole freaking video just on the steering wheels. But you can see, see this tape residue here? That's because these things break the housing. It just gets it all screwed up. Um, and for years, they've been selling new old stock ones of those and stuff, and it just it's a problem on a whole bunch of Atari games, including this one. Um, but we uh, we were able to get a gentleman to make a 3D printed one, so we're going to try that out in another video, so you will be seeing that coming. But that's what the tape residue is from. That must have screwed up, and they had something rigged up over it trying to hold it in place or something. Got some surface rust on these wheels. We'll see how clean we can get those to look. And then also this one has bolts, like a set up a certain way, and then they're set up a different way on that one, so we'll have to figure out which is correct. We got the two four-speed shifters that both look like they're about right. Push button to select track, single player start only, double player start only. Joey and I were brothers, of course. Whenever we were younger, we had one of these that we bought at an auction and uh, had in our house for a while. This is a cool game. It's got the original cardboard bezel under the plexiglass bezel here. Its day has finally came. <laughs> so the cabinet itself is a little rough. On this side, you can see where it's busted up apart at some point. We'll uh, see what we can do to fix that up. Help it out a little cosmetically. But it's not the end of the world. I mean, it's got crazy cool side art, of course. Still got the back door for it. The cable has been cut off. Power cord. And here's the problem. Whoo! So we're going to do a video on the cosmetics. We can fix that. It pretty bad but <laughs> so why would there be a big hole in the side because people want them ends that's why so uh, somebody has broken into this poor thing to steal its quarters but that's all right it found its way to a good place we're going to fix her up this game was made by Atari in beautiful Sunnyvale California and it's serial number 5297 SP2, Sprint 2, 5297. Made in the USA. Runs 3 amps through this sucker. And it may be covered by one or more of the following US patents. Don't try to copy it. Alright, so it's got the big old 25 inch 
I believe that is the Motorola monitor. I may be wrong about that. I believe that's the XM701. That's my guess. Let's see on live video if I'm correct about it. <laughs> it's either the XM701 or it's the M7000. Uh, doesn't say. Maybe to say on that side. M7000 it is. Is it Motorola? That's Motorola, right? That's what the M must be for. Uh, black and white monitor. Old school. It's got the, the shallow black and white tube. The um, deflection angle is different on... Um, color ones or most color ones. Look how thin the yoke is. Pretty wild. Uh, so hopefully that will cooperate. One thing I see is this high voltage diode has popped out of its socket. Fix that! Alright, so the good thing about these early Atari games is the electronics are real simple. So the power cord comes in here and comes up to a uh, power switch and another power switch and some stuff and uh, comes up here to this transformer and some fuses and then jumps over here to this board. Now I think I saw earlier this appears to be the original FCC filter board so that would have been right there and the plug plugs in the top and as you can see running AC through that edge connector has caused them some problems but they're still running edge AC through the edge connector just not on the filter board so they have it looks like soldered some of the wires to the board instead of running them through the edge connector. So we'll have to mess with that. This is all... Ooh, wait. May have misspoke. I was about to say no processor, but I see something up there. I can't pull it out because it's soldered in. Let's go in. Well, hello, Mr. Processor. That's some kind of processor, it looks like. Why, hello, Mr. Ram Chips, maybe. <laughs> we'll have to pull this out here shortly. So that's what we're looking at. So, uh, gonna be a cool one to fix. Stay tuned. Okay, folks, so. Good old Atari, Key, whoever, always did a great job with their early schematics. They're, even their later ones are good too, but the early ones especially, they tell you every little thing. So hopefully we can figure out how to fix it with the schematics. So uh, here is the relevant part with the, the wiring. So it says AC input here on the right. That's the part that's cut off. <laughs> okay, so it comes in and it just runs straight through an interlock switch. Now the reason, the purpose for that interlock switch is uh, if the back door were to fall off in the arcade or some kids screwed around with it and knocked it off, it would kill all the power. So hopefully the little hellions wouldn't electrocute themselves. So that switch fails open, right? And then you can pull it and lock it and lock it on if you're servicing it. Okay, and so that's in there. And then the on-off switch is uh, it looked like in the front somewhere where you could reach it maybe underneath the. Uh, it looked like the right um, gas pedal. So you've got an on-off switch, and then you run into a line filter. And then you have a three amp fuse that it runs through. And then the two lines go through a shorting block, which is just a little connector with jumpers on it. The reason for that is so that they could, it was an easy way to change the wiring on the transformer. So you could have a transformer that could support 110, 220, 105, 
240, all this stuff, depending on which jumpers were installed. So uh, the, the black and white lines will go into that. And then once they get, so like for instance, the black line is the hot, once it, or the line voltage, it would go to here, which splits into two lines, and then also up to here, which is a third line. Okay, so one of those lines powers one side of the transformer, one of the other lines powers the other side of the transformer, and then this line comes off and runs up here to power the monitor. They also have a fluorescent light for the top that's wired into the one of the windings on the transformer, the inputs. All of this likely is still fine. It's just they cut the cord off. Now why would they cut the cord off? Something's probably shorting or making a big loud noise or somebody stole the cord or something. So once it does that, the transformer will create several voltages that run all over the place. Okay. So we're we're concerned with this right now. So one thing I'm gonna do though is I'm gonna go ahead and unplug the monitor. Because the monitors are kind of hard to get, right? So I don't really need that monitor burning itself up if I can help it. So I'm just not even going to plug it in for now until we get the thing to come on and act right. Okay? So uh, looking at this, it doesn't, to me, there's really no, if I unplug the game board and unplug the monitor, there's nothing to really burn up except the transformer. But unless it's been hacked, that, that shouldn't happen. So we're going to unplug the monitor, unplug the board, and try to get a new uh, power line on there. If we can find one around there. We didn't have a new cord, but we had a used cord. What do you got there, Joe? That's a pretty good one. Yeah, it's period correct. Period correct. New end on it. No cuts. Looks good. It's a little discolored right there, Joe. Why don't you get some bleach and His get on that? The discolored, too. You know, he's got a good it point. Matches. That's what I'm saying. It's, and I like that it's gray, you know. Okay, so we have the interlock switch turned off. So the way that works is when the back door's on, it's pushed in, which connects them. When the back door pops off, it pops back out so the little kids don't get killed. But uh, you can pull it out to turn it on too and it'll lock in place. So it can pull out or be pushed in to connect. So it's off right now. So Joe's going to plug it in. Okay. We've got the board disconnected, but some of the power is still connected to the board because they soldered it to the board. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I think it'll be all right. Okay, so all we're going to, and we unplugged the monitor. All we're going to do is turn it on and just see if anything happens. If it blows up, if the transformer makes a bunch of noise, if the light works, stuff like that. All right, Joe, go ahead. Nothing. You think maybe it's turned off? Did you see a power switch? Yeah. It's probably turned off. I think there is a power switch down there. Send me on a wild goose chase. There's no power switch. Probably, Look in, it's probably in that hole. Yeah, it might be. Look in the door. I'm pretty sure I saw a power switch down there on there by that foot pedal. If you look in the back, you can see it. Uh-huh. You see it? There's something down there. Nothing. It could be the probably light bulb. just turned it off. Could be the light bulbs burn out. Yeah, if that power switch is down there, probably nobody's ever even known it was there. Okay, we need to unplug it and see if the fuse is any good, probably. All right, we're going to mess with it. We'll see what we can figure out. Okay, folks, so the fuse was blown. Uh, it says right here to take the cover off to replace the fuse, but you can get to it from the front, too. Did it blow again, Joe? I don't know. You tell we're me. We're checking uh, voltage on the transformer to see if we're getting any power. Nothing. Maybe the switch again. I think we've been playing with the switch, so we think it has to be stripped again. Okay. All right, folks. So our first sign of life is the, the uh, fluorescent bulb is starting to come on. <laughs> Very cool. All right, so uh, I think next, maybe, Joe, is uh, we plug the board in and see if we hear any sounds. I doubt it. Everything's so filthy in there. This thing, basically, it, it has a voltage regulator on the main PCB. Okay. Now, why would the fuse be blown? It could be they cut the power cord or they, they, they screwed something up whenever they 
we're trying to break into it. Okay, uh, maybe see if you can credit it up, Joe. Oh, let me show them the, the lights. So we have the three lights lit up. She's trying. All right, so she needs work. Go ahead and hit the button, though, before she burns herself up. Okay, so old capacitors are ruling the day. We're going to have to take the, uh, the board out and work on it a little bit, Joe. I'd like to kind of hear it play first before we, uh, before we uh, plug the monitor up, you know what I mean? I mean, we know it ain't working right. So uh, we're going to cut the wires that are soldered to the board and figure out exactly what they did with that. We're going to clean up the board a little bit, replace some capacitors, and uh, get it where we can actually test the voltage on the board. All right, folks, so here is the board. So if you look in the schematics, the uh, they don't tell you what the MPU is, but from what I understand, it's a 6502. Uh, yes. So old school... 6502, look at that sucker. December of 1976, Joe, what do you think? Boy, wasn't that a good time. It sure was. It's a Christmas baby. It's a Christmas baby. And this, uh, this, look at that freaking socket. What do you think about that socket, Joe? That's when they knew how to make a freaking yeah. socket. Look at that. There's little elves inside of there connecting everything together. Okay, and then we have ROM soldered to the freaking board. This 36th week of 1977, and this one was the 49th week of 1977, I believe. I guess that's what that means. Okay. Boy, that sure looks like it might be a RAM chip. You think that's a RAM, Joe? Probably. It's probably a RAM, people. All right, so uh, what is the problem? The problem is going to be... They had the wires soldered here, here, and we think here. No, there. Which seems to be the ground and the two 16.5 volt AC connections. Okay, I'm gonna go in there. I guess they run through diodes. Yes, yes they do. And then they run into this voltage regulator. Which is a... It's an LM323, Joe. That's it. You should have known that. Yep. Seen it a hundred times. LM323. All right. Okay. Um, but here's the problem. They, they always put these big filter caps on here, and these things get all screwed up. That's probably the whole problem. Probably. What do you think about that being the whole problem? I think it's a problem. That's probably the whole problem. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to clean up the board a little bit. Um, we're going to take the CPU out of its socket, clean it, and then put it back in its socket. Joe, will you give me that chip puller? They probably want to see that. Let's see what it looks like inside that huge freaking socket. It's in that drawer on the, I think it's on the left side, kind of sticking up. I saw it just a few minutes ago. We're going to pull this chip, but we need the chip puller to pull the chip. This connector on the side on the Atari boards was used to connect, like, some of their uh, test equipment. But I don't think anybody usually had them out in the civilian world. We used to always use a regular screwdriver, but somebody mailed us a chip puller and now we're spoiled. Yep, we're spoiled. We got to have a chip puller. We ain't using no damn bent screwdriver anymore. I'm trying to do it with one hand. Go ahead, Joe. Tell them how it's done. You think Tenny Son's watching us? That sheepdog. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're supposed to give a shout Tennyson. out. Tennyson. Tennyson. Tennyson, the sheepdog, is watching us. We're supposed to give a shout out. You're going to see me break Don't the chip. break that chip, Joe. That's a valuable one, too. Yeah, you give it to me. I want me to break it. I think I might need my regular that, screwdriver. Yeah, that screwdriver is failing on this. We need a. This was before. It's before if you wouldn't part. have said that, Joe, yep. it would have worked perfect. He jinxed us, people. He jinxed us bragging about the uh, bragging about the uh, 
The socket's too old. It can't use that chip puller. That chip puller is for modern devices. Don't break those those legs, Joe. Don't do it. No matter what you do, don't break it. These are solid gold. Okay. Okay, now remember which side goes where. Goes that way. Like where's that. our where's our mark here? I'm all screwed up. There it is, pin one. Pin one right there, people. Here's what the underside looks like. Okay. And then here's this big old cool freaking socket. Man, why don't they make them like that anymore? This is probably like a $25 socket. Look at that. What do you think, Joe? Should we change that out for one of these new cheap pieces of crap from no, China? No way. <laughs> that one there grabs that chip. I don't even think about it. <coughs> I don't see much to clean there. What do you think? We'll just put that back in there. That looks like that, about what we're going to do. All right, so uh, here we have a 4700 microfarad 25 volt DC capacitor. We're going to swap that sucker. And here we have an 8000 microfarad 16 volt capacitor and here we have one that looks a lot like it also an 8000 microfarad capacitor I wonder if they go to the same place they do now look they're across okay see that side they're both on the same and this side, they're both on the same. You know what that means, Jim? Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're in parallel. That's right. So you can replace two with one. I knew that. You see how to do that? Yeah. Put it over here and over there. You don't have to do it over here, over there, over there, and over here. Exactly. That would be a waste. Yep. Yeah. Not a waste of time. They're, now, people are going to reply down below and say, well, actually, <laughs> there's a reason they do that. It's so that if one fails, the other one will want to all that, right? But people, you're not here right now. Yep. So you can't stop us from doing what we want to do. We're going to take those two out and put one in its place. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, that's what we're looking at. And these things, they just get old. You can see they're starting to fall apart. They're literally falling apart. Look at that. Ooh. Ugh. Ugh. I lost the focus. If I'm going to focus back in, people want to see this. There we go. Look at that. That's got to go, folks. So that's those two, and then here's our third one. That's the good side. That's its face. Look at that. It's lasted long enough, folks. That's probably why the sound was changing as it went along and it was getting louder. All right, so we're gonna work on this board a little bit and uh, then we're gonna put it back in and we've got to test the um, voltage regulator somehow. We have to see what kind of power we've got on the actual board so here's what we're gonna do this this is a 4700 radial I mean axial so we're going to replace that no matter what y'all say with a 4700 axial and then this one 8,000 and 8,000 is 16,000 and we're going to replace that with an 18,000 no matter what y'all say that's the next step New capacitor, new capacitor. I put new ones here too, but I didn't have axial ones, and there's traces all over the freaking board, so I had to put heat shrink tube on the leg so it wouldn't short. Them. Okay, uh, and then I'm also going to replace these two uh, rectifying diodes. These things are old and they get leaky. I don't know what they are, but basically, if you put a beefy enough replacement in there you're fine so I always use 6A4 just because I have a ton of them so I'm gonna put two 6A4s in there and we'll see what the old ones were okay so the originals are MR501s let's see if that's what they actually are that's what it calls for on the actual in the schematic these are MR751s so just goes to show you they can swap them with whatever they want I guess let's see if that one is too yep MR751. All right, I looked up MR501. So let me go check MR751s to make sure I know exactly what these are. 
Okay, I looked it up. So the it calls for MR 501s, but it has MR 751s. The difference being these are beefier. They're six amp, and they are fast recovery. I just put in six A fours, which are not fast recovery. However, I don't think it needs fast recovery. According to the specs, it don't need fast recovery, so I think we're fine. But you got the the rectifying diodes. You've got to change, or you'll have trouble on the five volt line. Now on the, these two here are actually the audio ones. They may be troublesome too, but if you have problems with them, it's just your audio won't work. You'll lose your audio voltage. But on the five volt, I always replace these just because they uh, they give you a lot of problems. On these and uh, like stuff like asteroids, they have them underneath the power block. Okay, so uh, I think we're about ready to try it though, but we're gonna have to clean up the edge connector. It's not actually burnt. It looks pretty good. It's just dirty. And then the connector that plugs in, those wires that they cut, we need to repin and put back in the connector. Um, yeah, I'm not going to solder them back on the board. You know, It needs to be on something that can be removed. The reason that those burnt up is because it just, uh, one, it gets dirty, and then two, they ran it for probably 20 years till the thing blew up. Right? Whenever we sell this, it's likely going to go in somebody's house where they won't have that big of an issue. If they do eventually they can replace the connector if they need to but look it's an old board people you kind of got to go with what you got um, but none of it's damaged enough that it needs to be uh, um, there's really there's I mean you can put tape on it and stuff but it's not damaged enough that it needs any kind of repair okay folks so looking on the schematics um, there are two 16.5 volt AC lines going to pins three and four that was two of the ones that they cut and they're reversible. It doesn't matter, you know, because it's coming from the transformer. And then there were two grounds that goes to pins 2 and B that they have tied together. The grounds are just the center tap of the transformer winding. So those two go in 2 and B. 1, 2, 3, 4, blah, blah, blah. And then the other side, it's A, B, blah, 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 blah. So uh, we're putting them back, crimping new um, connectors on it and pop them in there. Now if you need connectors, we use this little uh, crimper. We like these. We have these linked on our website. Go to lionsarcade.com to the parts page and there's links to stuff like this that we use in our repair videos uh, that you can get like on Amazon and stuff like that. They'll send you to Amazon. If you buy anything on Amazon, what could they buy on Amazon, Joe? Anything. Anything. You could buy a toaster. Cat food. Cat dog food, food, dog food, both types. Yep. Um, if you buy anything on Amazon after following one of our links, it gives us a tip. So we appreciate everybody that's been doing that, it's even if you don't want to buy crimpers or whatever. Uh, and if you need the actual crimps, you can get stuff like this from Twisty Wrist Arcade. It's a, a good site that sells a bunch of stuff like that. So I'm going to put the rest of these in, and then uh, we'll be ready to plug it back in and fire it up. Boy, it's loud. We're going to have to get brave enough to turn the monitor on eventually, Joe. Okay, so next up we need to check the voltages on the board and see if uh, R5 is working or not. Okay, I can't show you very easily, but I've got 5.09 on the IC chips on the board, which is perfect. A little bit high, but that's how we like it. Okay, uh, so we're ready to try to plug the monitor in which may have catastrophic effects, but <laughs> we'll find out. Okay, Joe, you ready? Yep. Let's do it. Come turn her off. Plug her back up. And I'm gonna stand back and show them what happens when we turn it on. Go ahead. Got neck glow at least. Let's see if we get fire on the back of the monitor. To hell with looking at the screen picture, people. We want to see if the monitor catches on fire. We can go look at the screen anytime. You got anything, Joe? Gibberish. All right, he says there's gibberish. Let's see what it looks like. 
Hit the lights, Jim. Okay. Boy, I don't like that. Could just be a sync thing, though. Okay, so obviously the program is not running, so we're going to have to troubleshoot that next. But that explains why the sound is doing what it's doing. Um, we don't know if the clock is running or any of that. All right, folks, so on the front door of this thing, it's all beat up which a lot of times isn't that big of a deal, but on this particular game, on, on some of these older Atari games, if the coin switch isn't hooked up right, it will cause you problems because the game is kind of designed where it needs the coin switches to keep it out of reset. So it had a wire unhooked there. Look, it's got two wires shorted here. And so sometimes, on some games, I see this on pinball machines too, on EM pinball machines, if the coin door switches are shorted, a lot of times the game will not run right. On more modern, like JAMA games, if the coin door switches are messed up, the game just won't um, coin up, but it'll come up and run. This thing is mangled. I'm going to replace these connectors. Obviously, all of this needs work. But I'd like to test if that has anything to do with it. Coming up all jumbled. <laughs> Let's see if that helps anything. Let's try turning it on. Hmm. It sounds better. It's not making our loud noise anymore, at least. Yep. Look. It's so bright out, you can't see, but yeah, she's up and running. Wow. <laughs> Coin door switch, people. Why in the world? <laughs> that is strange. We might have, we had to look that up and see why it does that. Okay, so I don't completely understand how it works, but if you look at one of those switches there, it's got a ground connection that comes out and connects to both of the switches. One of those was disconnected. Okay, and that ground is always connected to the um, coin input. So the coin input is always grounded. And you can see that there is a pull-up resistor here on the, the coin input. Okay, but because of that normally closed lug on the switch it's always grounded okay so when you drop a quarter through the switch comes over here and grounds the play meter but what it really does is it allows this line to go high so whenever the input goes high and then it goes back to ground uh, it registers that as you put a coin in. It gives you a credit. So like here's one of the inputs. It's on a 153. That's just how they've designed the thing. So what happens is if that wire is broke off or the switch is messed up or bent or something like that, the thing is constantly giving you a credit and it don't like that. And so the board won't boot. A very strange. Now let me show you something about the sprint schematics and how they uh, detail how things work. So there's a section, I believe, on how that works. Okay, so the early Atari schematics were notorious for being so well written out that they explain every little thing, so it's pretty cool. Now, I don't understand all of this, but it's you can just see the level of detail they gave you. And they, they put this in the cabinet. So everybody got this. This wasn't secret information that they hid. They wanted you to know how the thing, exactly how it works. So it says, the main component of the manual control interface is multiplexer M8. This component acts as a two-pole, four-position switch, operated by address lines ADR6 and ADR7 from the microcomputer MPU. Table 4.3 lists the input-output relationship of multiplexer M8 with the given address inputs. Multiplexer M8 interfaces three different sources of information as follows. One, coin information. Two, steering information. And three, switch information. 
All information is received by the microcomputer MPU when the MPU addre addresses the address decoder for a low logic level switch, not switch, signal that enables tri-state devices K5 for a data output on the D6 and D7 data lines. Coin information is a matter of storing in the microcomputer RAM the number of times a low logic level pulse appears on the data lines. When the appropriate address input of multiplexer M8 is being addressed, the microcomputer MPU only looks for uh, when it's being addressed. The mic I forgot to put the right uh, phrasing there. The microcomputer MPU only looks for coin pulses during the attract mode. I got to be honest with you, somebody walked by out front, and so I noticed. <laughs> Okay, so it only looks for these coin pulses during the track mode. So it says it, it just stores how many times a low level, a low logic level pulse, right? But remember, uh, I don't know if you saw that. It runs through an inverter. Um, let me go back to that. Just so we get the whole thing. Let's get the whole thing here. So it's high, but it inverts right there. So it's the number of times that it gets a low level up here, right? Uh, which it would get if this line goes high, but this line won't go high if it's tied to ground. Right? So back to where we were. Where were we? It's up here somewhere. It's telling you how the motor is generated. So it's got everything on here, right? Steering information is looked for by the microcomputer MPU during the play mode. The steering printed circuit assembly consists of two light emitting diodes that are op optically aligned with two light sensitive transistors. A tooth cylinder that is turned by the steering wheel is inserted between the light emitting diodes and the transistors and interrupts the light from the diodes. When the steering wheel is turned, two pulses appear at the output of the steering printed circuit assembly that differs in phase. As illustrated in figure 4-6, when the wheel is turned to the right, the A output pulse leads the B output pulse. When the wheel is turned to the left, the A output pulse lags the B output pulse. The inverse of the two pulses are applied to the D and clock inputs of two D-type flip-flops. See the schematic. Because they give you the full schematic. So anyway, you see what I'm talking about. They tell you every little freaking thing. They tell you exactly... Switch information is received by multiplexer M8 at inputs 1CO and 2CO. So what, what they're telling you the freaking pin that it's coming in on. The microcomputer MPU addresses decoders F9, H9, and J9 to determine if a switch is open or closed. If closed, the low blah, 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 blah. You see what I'm saying? This is the gold standard of, um, of operator manuals for this kind of stuff. It's a damn shame... <laughs> That when you get something now, it doesn't have any of this. They don't want you knowing how to fix the thing. They want you to throw it in the trash and buy another one from China. Right? But these were the days, people. 1975 or 1976, whatever it was. That was before my time. I was but a gleam in my father's eye in 1976. So anyway, uh, that's why if the coin door switch is unplugged, the pull-up resistor on the board means makes it where the board thinks you're constantly getting a quarter. That's just how they designed it. So it looks like the board's up and running. Um, we need to work on the monitor, do some more electronic stuff to it, of course, though. Uh, and we can't test it yet because the steering wheels are all screwed up. I mean, I guess we could try to play it. So we don't know if any of the sound's right. The... Uh, Monitor hasn't been rebuilt. Looks all right, though. Um, and we don't know if any of the switches or the gas pedal or the steering or anything works. The steering, we know that the housings are cracked on, so we have a solution for that. We're going to do a whole other video on, though. Um, we're we're uh, working with a guy to make that happen. Finally, for all of the Atari fans. Okay, so uh, let's see if she'll coin up. Easy peasy. Okay, here we go. Now, on this particular game, the first player is actually on the right. The second player is on the left. Old school, baby. 
Okay, push start button. Push button to change tracks. I've got that button that popped out of the uh, control panel, so I can't reach it right now. So we're just going to try the original one. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. Oh, I'm not in the right gear. I'm hitting the walls. <laughs> oh, no. That's right. That's right. Now what? Oh, man, I hit the walls again. I wasn't ever any good at this. You know who could play this? My brother, Donnie. All the driving games he was great at. If you haven't seen his channel, my brother has a channel here on YouTube, my brother Donnie. The link is down below all of our videos. You can see uh, he's crazier than I am. I don't know if he's crazier than Joey, though. Look, I'm a granny, it says. Ugh. It's so embarrassing, and I did it on live television. Okay, so uh, check out my brother's channel, my brother Donnie. Now, this one we're going to have to... We're going to have to do some more work on. I mean, it looks like... See, this is the point where a lot of people would sell it and say, Works 100%. Survivor, super rare. Come on, people. We can't do that. We got to fix it better than this. Come on now. Come on, people. So uh, we're going to do another video where we do the cosmetic stuff. And we're going to do another video where we do the steering housing. There is a plastic piece that the steering that makes the steering wheel work. Uh, that, as you can see, and this one's still functional, but it's all broke up and everything. The steering wheels are trying to fall out of the game. So uh, we, have, uh, we have found a solution to that. So we're going to do a video on that, hopefully to help everybody else that has an Atari... A uh, game that needs that steering housing. Maybe theirs is cracked up too. But we'll do that on a further video. Hey folks, do you want to know how you can support our channel? If you enjoy great content like this. Look how it's changing all of the tracks. That's pretty cool. Uh, 12 different tracks it says. Freaking straight up a track mode in a 1976 game. Deal with it. Um, you know how you can support our channel? If you're going to buy anything on Amazon, we have a link down below to Amazon. If you use our link, they count that as we sent you to Amazon, so they pay us a tip for doing that. And it's a certain percentage of your purchase. So if you're going to buy anything on Amazon, if you just click our link before you do it, you give some of the money you were already going to spend, so you don't have to spend any extra money or anything, uh, to us for doing that. So we appreciate people that have been doing that. Really helps us out. Makes us want to make more videos. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, we appreciate everybody that's done that. Somebody the other day bought a new cell phone on there, and uh, it was kind of expensive. So, whoever did that, thank you. But people buy little stuff all the time on there, too, and that's just fine. So, um, I hope you enjoyed the video. This is kind of cool, seeing this thing come back to life. Did you notice that ultimately the problem was a wire was unplugged on the coin door? That's how solid they built these freaking things. Now, it's probably going to die on me now that uh, I said that. But somebody had vandalized it and cut the cord off of it. Uh, I talked to Joe, and whenever he talked to the guy that he got it from, he said that that's what they were doing. People were breaking in and stealing copper. We're fortunate they didn't steal the yoke off of the uh, tube. A lot of crackheads will take a hammer or something and uh, uh, break the tube on a TV or anything or something like this just to get the, the blunk of uh, copper off the back of it that is the yoke. But they didn't do that to this one. Uh, so someone had cut the cord off. Uh, what else did we do? We plugged in a wire. I gotta admit, I did uh, turn some knobs on the monitor to get it looking like this. Uh, oh, the, fu uh, the fuse was blown. Replaced the fuse. We, we worked on the board, but it, you know, it may have still worked without doing that. You know, those two diodes tested fine. I just replaced them because they were old. Um, and the caps looked like crap, but they may have still been working. This is just well-built stuff. 1976, it's still up and running. Very cool. So on the next video, we will do the housing thing, and then we will have to fix that big hole in the side and repaint some of the side art. So we'll see you then. Hope you enjoyed it. Give us a thumbs up for taking the trouble to film it for you, and we'll see you on the next video.